This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. Clients love it when we reduce their taxes and we show them different ways to reduce their taxes. And two of the biggest ways to reduce a client's taxes are cost segregation and research and development tax credits. And uh, today we have an expert in this field, Kim Lockridge. Kim is with uh, Engineered Tax Services and Kim and I have known each other for, I think about forever, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Kim is a, a one of our go-to, uh, really our go-to um, person, engineer tax services we've been using for years and years and years. Um, and so I wanted to bring Kim on to talk about uh, these two issues, uh, which are uh, big in the news, but there's a lot of changes going on too. So Kim, uh, welcome to the Wealth Ability Show for CPAs. Thank you so much, Tom. It's really great to see you and for uh, for being on the show today. So I really appreciate the invite and looking forward to our call today. Awesome. So if you would, Kim, just give uh, our listeners a little bit of your background. Yeah, sure. So uh, I've been with ETS for about 15 years. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, an entrepreneur and uh, I've been investing in real estate myself. I have my own portfolio since the late 90s and uh, have a lot of expertise. Uh, not only do I uh, do the cost segregation and the tax strategies uh, for a job, but I also incorporate them into my own uh, portfolio, which I think is very important because it gives me that, um, you know, that insight as to how how it works with, you know, passive versus active. How does it really impact me? And and I have that firsthand knowledge, um, you know, of those, those types of situations and, uh, you know, carry forwards and how they work and how we can really strategize using those losses moving forward. So that's kind of my yeah. background in a nutshell. I, I think you're right, Kim. So um, thank you for that. I think you're right. When I started, um, I've been involved in the tax aspects of real estate for 40 years, but until I started investing in real estate, um, you really get a different perspective because you see what the clients are seeing. And I, I remember, so I want to start with this. I remember several years ago, this is probably 20 years ago, um, on um, Arizona Society of CPAs has uh, what they call listserv. And on that, and it's a dis just a discussion forum and it's been around forever. And on that discussion, there was um, a lot of comments about cost segregation. This is literally 20 years ago. And people were asking, well, I don't think it's legal. I think it's aggressive. I think it's something that, you know, I, it's really something we shouldn't be doing. And uh, so what do you say when you have accountants when you hear that, because I'm sure you hear that from clients and accountants, they say, well, wait a minute, cost segregation, that's aggressive. Yeah, I, I appreciate I appreciate this question a lot because um, it does come up and there are still some CPAs out there, old school, that just feel like this is uh, aggressive and, and you're just asking for an audit. I hear that a lot. Um well, and what I do and how I combat that is I give them our statistics. Um, so I've been doing this for 15 years. The Engineer Tax Services has been in business since 2001. So we're in our 22nd year now. Um, and we offer audit defense. So with our products, when we offer audit defense, obviously, if there is an audit, we are the first ones to hear about it, right? So, um, and in our statistics, um, you know, we run somewhere between three and 400 studies a month across the country. We work nationwide. And um, those uh, statistics in the 15 years that I've been doing this, we've had, um, you know, count on one hand uh, some audits, right? So or IDRs, actually. It's not even a full-blown audit, just an IDR. And they're asking questions about the cost segregation studies. Now, we we are very, very careful. And every time that there's an audit technique guideline or if there's a modification to the audit technique guideline specific to cost segregation, we obviously have our attorneys and we dig into those very deeply to make sure that we are in line with the regulations for cost segregation. And so in that history, those five five, uh, you know, uh, audits, actually, it's been four audits in the last 15 years that I've been here. Um, we haven't had any disallowances. And there's multiple reasons for that. Um, one is because we're basing our cost segregation in science. Okay, so we have to remember that cost segregation has been around since the 1940s. We can track those court cases all the way back to the 1940s that give us the ability to do what we're doing today. And so with that said, you know, and with all of the history that we have, the audit technique guidelines specifically for cost seg, 
Um, we like to explain it in layman's terms to the clients like this. Um, a cost segregation study is kind of like the difference between doing, uh, you know, filing a 1040 and filing a 1040EZ. So a 1040EZ, clients can do that on their own. It's a one or two page document. They don't need a CPA. They can just you know, do, do it. They take their standard deductions and run, right? Uh, very simple. And that's what straight line depreciation is for buildings, right? It's just your standard depreciation over 27 and a half or 39 years. And doing a 1040, you know, usually they have to hire a CPA. There's a little bit more to it when they have to itemize their deductions and they get a lot more in return for that fee because they're able to take um, so much more depreciation. Uh, or deductions in that case. In in the case of a cost seg study, a cost seg is equivalent to the 1040. You know, we're itemizing the building. We're not just depreciating the whole building in 27 and a half or 39 years. We're actually going in from an engineered based uh, position and we're breaking down all of the assets in the building and, uh, you know, in science, right? So they can't argue with it. These are the assets in the building and assigning a, 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 a price for each of those assets in accordance with the RS means, which is the IRS approved pricing guide. Um, we also include a condition factor for those assets, you know, because you might buy a house or a building that's, you know, 20 years old and it's new to you, you know, we're certainly can't give it the same value you as a brand new building. So we actually include a condition factor for each of those assets. Now you can't do that without doing a site visit. And a site visit is required. Uh, don't let anyone fool you. Uh, the virtual site visits were allowed during COVID, but now that that's over, there needs to be an in-person site visit by an engineer, not just a photographer, not just an appraiser. We really need to make sure that we have an engineer on site. So with all of those things intact, um, cost segregation isn't aggressive. It's actually more substantive than, uh, you know, than not doing it because you have all the facts, the science behind it. Yeah. Let, let, let me add a, a comment to that. Um, under the Internal Revenue Code, uh, your depreciation, your depreciated basis is based on depreciation allowed or allowable. So technically, a cost segregation is required. Um, under the code, because uh, it, and it, if you look at when you do a 3115, which is right when you do a cost segregation on an old property, you do 3115, that's a change in accounting method. And there are two types of changes of accounting method. There's a change from an allowable to an allowable, like from the cash method to the accrual method, or there's a change from a um, incorrect to a correct method. And uh, so which one is cost segregation, Kim? Yeah. Well, it depends on the gear. It's an incorrect to a correct method, it, right? It so is. Yeah, it is. But there there are also complexities with that surrounding the bonus depreciation because the bonus depreciation might be, you might have filed it on a, per, or a permissible or an impermissible method. Um, and that also, can, you know, makes it a little bit more complicated but yes, you're you're actually making making that change in general to that, but but it gets complex when you start getting into the bonus depreciation rules. I I, I get that. Well, let's 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 start with the basics here, okay? okay. I find it's always easiest to start with the basics, and then we can get a little more detailed um, when we yeah. need to. Um, but the basics really are: it is an a change. If you look at the thirty one fifteen, it's a change from an incorrect to a correct method because mm -hmm. you are not correctly depreciating those assets that you clearly bought. You clearly bought the contents of the building. You clearly bought the, the land improvements. You didn't just buy the building and the land. You did buy those other components. And so the fact that you don't do a cost segregation, technically incorrect. Now the IRS says, we're okay. We'll take your money. If you do it in incorrectly and you actually give us more money, we're okay with that. So the yeah. IRS isn't going to argue when you don't do a cost segregation, even though Technically, when you sell that building, they could. Technically, they could say, wait a minute, you this is allowed or allowable. You didn't take it. It was allowable. You didn't take it. Therefore, you really have more gain than what you're reporting on your on your uh, sale when you sell that building. So th this is something I, I always explain to people that I believe that a cost segregation is more conservative than not doing a cost segregation. And of course the worst is when people do their own cost so-called cost segregation. And not only is the IRS say, no, you can't do that. But the other side of that, Kim, is do you find that there's a lot more depreciation that an engineer is going to find 
than if somebody does it kind of quick and dirty. Yeah, without a doubt. We've seen that over and over and over. Um, and here's why. Here's the scientific reason why it's uh, it's going to be more valuable. Um, if you're doing a, um, if you're not an engineer, okay, we are not allowed to break down the mechanical, the electrical and plumbing, right? So all of the mechanical, electrical and plumbing has to stay in a 27 and a half or 39 year class life um, regardless, okay? Now, if you're an engineer, that changes because the, the IRS understands that the engineers know building building um, you know components. And let me give you an example. Um, in, a, let's say an apartment building, multifamily, um, you know, you have kitchens and bathrooms, right? Um, if you think of the kitchen, in the kitchen, there's a range, there's a dishwasher, a garbage disposal, a microwave and a refrigerator, usually, right? And so when you have the mechanical, the electrical and the plumbing that service those assets, now all of those assets are five-year assets. But if you do a cost segregation study and you have an engineer that breaks it down, it can actually solidify the MEP. Um, we are allowed to go in and anything that services that five-year asset right. can now also be put into a five-year uh, bucket. So you think of the water lines that go from the sink, the garbage disposal to the dishwasher. You think of the water lines that go from the sink to the refrigerator to service a, a water dispenser. You think of the electrical behind, there's a port behind every refrigerator for you can plug it in microwave, dishwasher range, all of that, washers, dryers, televisions now have the ports right behind the TV, specially dedicated for a five-year asset. All the electrical and the mechanical that go all the way back to the service line or the breaker box um, is counted as five-year property. So just in general, you know, if you're doing it yourself and you're not an engineer, you can't break that down. But if you have an engineer do it, we will we'll get much better benefits. So let's uh, let's turn a little bit. Thank you. That was a great explanation. Um, let's turn a little bit to bonus depreciation. So bonus we had we have on five uh, anything under twenty years, right? So anything under twenty years, which means both the five it's the five and seven year property as well as the fifteen year land improvement property, and of that, um, so bonus depreciation twenty twenty two hundred percent, twenty twenty three eighty percent. And it goes down to zero in a few years, right? Yeah, 2027, it'll be zero. Yeah, it'll be zero. Now, did you do cost segregations before 2017? <laughs> we certainly did. There's a lot of people that ask me that. What are you going to do when bonus depreciation goes away? It's like, well, we've been doing this for a long time. So uh, bonus depreciation didn't even come out until 2006 for the first time. And it was only 50% on new construction or right. improvements, new money that was spent. So yeah, we've been doing cost seg for a long time before bonus. Yeah. So um so so bonus depreciation is a um it, is it still a big deal? Okay. So cuz we're still at 80%. So um what kind of percentages are you finding typically on a typical let's take a typical residential um building? What kind of percentages do you are you looking at from a under 20 year property? What percentage of the asset are you typically yeah, so yeah, we're looking at, um, you know, so on average, I usually look at about 30%. Um, we're, we're seeing anywhere from 28 to 38% uh, shift, depending on the assets in, in the finishes. Um, and of course, the landscaping and the lot line. And that's as a percentage of the improvements, right? So you, that's, that's is that percentage of the entire purchase price or percentage of the improvements, in, in other words, excluding land, the yeah, that would be net of land. Yeah, so any of these numbers that I talk about are going to be net of land because obviously Got land it. is not depreciable. So, so, so somewhere really between 20 and 25 percent. I would say more like 30 is probably a good a good average, good solid average. Um, of of the improvements. So of the total purchase price, where do where yeah? Do you so let's say you have uh, you buy it for 1.2 and you have a million dollars in improvements, right? Yeah. Or or building so about 300,000. About three hundred thousand in tax deductions. Now that's right. what gets shifted between both five and fifteen year assets. Right. So yeah, so if you're in twenty twenty three, eighty percent of that three hundred thousand you get up front, and then the other twenty percent goes between five and fifteen year property. Got it. So I have to break this down in my head math wise because clients are always asking this question. <laughs> so if if my 
if I get 30% of 80%, that's 24%. So yeah. if, if your land, if your land is historically, it's, it's somewhere in that 20% range. Um, sometimes it's higher. Sometimes it's lower. Um, condos, certainly lower. Um, mm-hmm. uh, other, you know, uh, empty warehouses, certainly higher, um, or, or building pads sometimes higher. Um, but you're in that 20 to 25% range of the total purchase price. And, and that's what I want to, you know, really focus on. Let's say you're at 25% of that total purchase price and then 80% of that. So 80% of 25% is 20%, meaning that 20% of that purchase price is deductible first year. And remember that includes whatever the bank put in. So this is a a way when you're explaining it to your clients as to why this is so important, you're talking about on a $1.2 million building, 20% or $240,000. And if you've got an 80% loan value, that's 100% of the money you put in. So, you know, we get bonus depreciation, we get cost segregation on the bank's money, not just our money, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's the power of it. Um, because, you know, I have a lot of clients, especially now with the tightness of lending and the interest rates going up, a lot of clients are buying properties, um, for cash, right? We see that, but you know, if you, if we can teach our clients how to, to leverage that and to actually put less money in, instead of buying one property, they can buy three properties and have that much more depreciation. That money is going to come right back in their pocket and they're going to have a lot more cash flow going forward than just paying cash for something. Um, There's a different, you know, of course you have the Burr method and all these other things that are out there in the market, but, uh, but you know, there is a lot of power in using the bank's money uh, for this because you get all the benefit from, from the entire purchase. Yeah, exactly. So um, let's talk about the, the complaint I get or the, the caution I get that I hear from actually new clients because they've left, they're leaving their old accountant because their old accountant's not doing cost segregation. And their old accountant said, well, wait a minute. Um, You know, uh, or I hear this actually from developers. We don't do cost segregations because our clients are all passive. So um, first of all, let's, let, let's start with the premise. Let's say, okay, let's say they are passive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I actually believe that's a cop out because I don't I don't think it's that hard to create passive income, um, but that's a whole different discussion. But let's say they are passive. What's the tax benefit if you're if you've got a high income taxpayer? Um, there's a permanent tax benefit right to a cost segregation, even if they're passive. Yeah, yeah, I. Um... I think it's very interesting, and I totally agree with you about the excuse that, oh, they're passive, so they can't do cost seg. I I think that is absolutely a cop out um, because I see it not only in my own practice, but um, but in in many others. And and I can I can kind of disprove that a little bit. Um, You know, it's one thing if you you buy a property and you do some renovations and you get a lot of tax deductions and then you have some passive loss carry forward. So we understand and we understand that there's some limitations about how much you can take depending on how your structured. But, uh, you know, if you've had that property for four or five years, it's stabilized, those improvements are done, and now you have a stabilized income and you are paying tax on that passive income, doing a cost seg study is going to wipe that away. So it's going to help reduce that tax liability on the passive side, not to mention the carry forward. So let's say, for instance, um, you have a property and then over the course of five years, you bought two more properties, right? And and those, and now you can use that grouping election and you can do a cost seg on the last one you purchased and that grouping election can ha- help offset some of that passive income from the other properties, right? So it becomes a tax strategy of really putting together a, a program for that particular client on what not only uh, they're doing right now, but let's talk about what their future looks like. Are you still planning to buy more properties? And then of course, if one of them sells, you know, you can use that to offset the gain from that sale as well. So there's so many benefits to doing it even when you're passive. So I'm going to add one more for you, Kim. So uh, you, you, you track my numbers. You tell me if I'm, if I'm right or wrong. Okay. I'm (laughs) going to put it out there. I'm going to put it out there in the universe because I talk about it all the time. Let's say I've got a client that's in the 37% tax bracket. Okay. Now, when I take that depreciation and it carries over, let's say I'm I hold that property for five years 
and I sell that property after five years. Okay. So um, I've gotten that depreciation. That depreciation is that um, I get to use that. I don't have to use it to offset the gain, right? I get to use it to offset my ordinary income. Yeah. So I get a 37% tax uh, benefit, but what's my, my maximum tax rate on recapture is 25%. Right. So I have a 12% permanent tax swing because I did the cost segregation. Now somebody say, well, isn't there reca isn't there 1245 recapture? So how do you address that for five-year property? Okay. I'm going to, this is, I'm curious as to hear, I, I, we haven't, we didn't pre-plan this. I know how I do it, but I'd like to know how you do it. Okay. So you've had a five-year, you've got a five-year asset. It's five years down the road. You sell the property. Okay. According to the government, what's that asset worth? A five-year after five years, zero. So zero. how much of your sales price are you going to allocate to that five-year property? Well, anything minus that five-year asset because now it's gone. Zero, right? right? Because, and, because and if that, we dispose of that asset before we do the reconciliation and that asset is now disposed and you write it off, it's going to reduce the recapture. Right, but let's say it's still there, right? Okay, right. we haven't disposed of it. But okay. after five years, the government is effectively saying that it's worth zero. Right. So why would we allocate sales price to that property if we've written the whole, if it's a five-year asset? And and that that's my question. I mean, I, I get that, you know, somebody say, well, the buyer though, I mean, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on this, actually. We're getting to some uh, just what ifs here, but the buyer mm -hmm. can also do a cost segregation, right? And they're probably going to attribute some value to that. So, um, but is there any, you know, how do you reconcile that or do you have to reconcile that? Yeah, so we've been around this, uh, you know, quite a bit. And and there are some, there is a, a code and I don't know it off the top of my head. I didn't realize this was, this topic was going to come up, but um, there is something, it, um, you can allocate or not allocate what you want to the asset. Um, but what you don't want to do is put it in the purchase contract uh, that way. Now, that would further solidify, you know, the asset was of no value if you get the buyer to agree to it. But if you do that, the buyer is now restricted and cannot do a cost right. study. So we got to be very careful that that's not in the purchase contract that way and that it's only being allocated on the tax side, um, you know, to prevent them from, you know, not being able to do a cost seg. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's exactly the way that I would deal with it. And and then, of course, while we're talking about recapture, if you do a 1031 exchange, you don't have any recapture at all. So why not look at that too? You would still have recapture on personal property if you had personal property. So um, there's no 1031 exchanges on personal property anymore, right? So we don't have that. We don't have that available to us. Well, actually, actually, yes, we do. And we went in this and the IRS actually retracted that the way that they had written it originally when they said you can't do the 1031 exchange with personal property. Um, they were referring specifically, if you read the original code, they were they were talking specifically about FF&E type personal property, vehicles, um, you know, golf carts, equipment, uh, artwork, um, you know, any of those things, which which triggers to us that that's not 1245 property, that's actually FF&E. So if you buy a hotel and that includes furniture and TVs and, and equipment, that has to be extracted out of the 1031 exchange, right. but not assets that are actually in store installed into the property. Got so it. our five-year asset doesn't include uh, that provision. And they did come back and clear that up um, a couple of years later um, uh, after promptings yep. on Capitol Hill that we were involved with. So um, so we can do a 1031 exchange and still include the total purchase uh, price. Except for the FF&E, right? Yeah, minus FF&E, but you wouldn't <laughs> okay. include that in the building purchase anyway. But but the 1245 property, five-year asset, 15-year uh, asset, if that does not count. If it's installed, that that's part of the real estate under 1031. Yep, exactly. So we that's, don't have to extract those. That's a good yeah. clarification. Thank you, Kim. Um, just for a minute now, I'd like to turn to uh, the our R and D credit. Um, because I just like to know, cause you guys, I know you guys have people on Capitol Hill. You're checking on this all the time. Of course, the big issue right now is not the credit. It's the deduction that we're missing. And so what are you seeing, uh, right now, of course, under the 2017 law for 2022, 
we don't get to deduct our research and development costs. Those have to be capitalized. So um, first question is, just so everybody knows and everybody's on the same page, um, what's the life, what, what, what life do you capitalize it to when you have research and development costs? Yeah, so right now, uh, starting in 2022, we have to amortize the the 174 expenses for R&D, and that's over a five-year period of time. Okay. Um, so, you know, in five years, the, 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 the clients are going to be back up to where they were. But I, I want to make sure that there's there's a lot of misconceptions around this, especially associated with the R&D tax credit. A lot of people think that because you're amortizing the expenses, okay, uh, that that also is going to diminish or uh, eliminate the credit from the research and development tax credit. And that's not the case. Right. The credit calculations remains the same on all of the expenditures that were set. So you take the entire amount that was spent that year and you get to still include that in the R&D tax credit. So your tax credits won't change. Those will remain the same. In fact, they're more important than ever because you don't have those expenditures immediately in one in one year. Um, so that is a five-year amortization starting in 2022. I will give you an update date. Um, we have been working on this for the last two years, but because it wasn't I imminent, uh, nobody really paid attention to it. So we were the only ones talking about it. Um, we had a congresswoman who uh, bought into uh, you know this on Capitol Hill with us and, and set, saw the detriment and was trying to fix it. And ultimately, she was killed in a car accident. Okay. So we had to go back to the drawing board and find uh, a couple other congressmen and senators to help us with this bill. And back then, a couple of years ago, when we started this, it was uh, you know very very Republican based. Um, since then, we've gotten the attention from so many different parties, and now this is a bipartisan cause. We have uh, countless, I, I'm going to put this out there to all of your listeners. If you have a client who is being uh, adversely impacted by this R&D credit, please, I beg you to have them write a letter about their impact and how this is uh, detrimental to their business and send it to me directly. I can get it to Capitol Hill. Um, we need their voices. If we don't speak up about this, they're not going to do anything about it. But I will tell you, we have some traction. We have a couple of bills. Uh, they were eliminated from some of the bills, but now we have something that we think that will have some, some traction before the end of the year. It will not change uh, by the 2022 tax filing extension date, but but we we do we are hopeful that going forward in 23 that that will be modified. Yeah, there of course a lot of this been held up by the child tax credit, right? Um, right. Where there is a a large contingency in the, on the Democratic side of the of the House that wants is insisting on the child tax credit in exchange for they're not opposed, they just see it as leverage. Um, right. So uh, that means that should this pass at the end of the year, we've got amended returns. If we've got corporate clients, partnership clients, yeah. no amended returns. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be quite difficult. Um, you know, I, I would um, caution there, there are a couple articles out there by some very prominent CPA firms that we absolutely adamantly disagree with. A couple of them have come out and said, you know, uh, basically, why would we just file it under a 174 expense? Why don't we just file it under a regular expense and take the full, um, you know, full amount? But the problem is, is that if you've been filing with the 174 and then you don't file with the 174, that is going to be the number one red flag the IRS has told us that that's what they will be looking for, knowing that that is probably fraudulently filed and that shouldn't be, it do should you, have 174 do you, expenses. Do you think that is a change in accounting method? You know, that's a good question. We're st obviously still waiting for guidance on how yeah. they're going to want us to deal with it. It's, uh, you know, it's a good question. I, I don't have the answer for that right now. And I certainly don't want to make an assumption. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, you know, it, there certainly are expenses that you, you know, there, there's a reasonable argument that they could be 174, they could be 162, right? Yeah. So, and, mm -hmm. and if that's routine expenses, you could argue that they're 162 expenses. Of course, you're giving up the credit um, yeah. by, by calling them 162 expenses. Um, but I think that with, uh, you know, we've got a, this administrative adjustment mechanism for partnerships, it is going to be very tempting for people to try to avoid um, having to do that. What I would like to suggest, though, to everybody is please don't be lazy. Um, yeah. the first four letter word in the in in, in accounting is be, is a lazy accountants because 
Um, just because you do an administrative adjustment, remember that's actually more work for you. You get to bill for that. Um, it's not your fault that uh, Congress uh, hasn't acted. It's not your fault that uh, the Trump administration put this in the law in the first place. You know, th th you didn't lobby for it. So um, as, as a result, to me, I never understood why accountants complain about additional work when they're always looking for additional work. Um, it just seems counterintuitive to me, but um, I, I I appreciate that. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Good luck with that. And I yeah. agree. You know, with the, I mean, that's very important. Uh, one of the things that I wrote in my book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, I did a chapter on R&D. And um, one of the things I noticed, uh, I did charts and tables on 15 countries, um, different countries. And in the R&D world, we're actually uh, close to the bottom. Yeah, so we, we are. actually we actually have the worst research and development tax benefits in the world um, of France, uh, Singapore, South Africa, I mean, China, India, China, just, just to name a few are, are, have way more um, tax benefits and incentives on research and development than the U S. So this is, I do believe this is a very important uh, topic. It's not, you know, we're looking at more of the technical aspects, but remember if you're, if you are an advocate for your client, which um, I think a tax advisor should be, um, even though the I, AICPA doesn't require it anymore. It's actually, that was a change. I don't know if you saw that. Um, AICPA just says it's okay to be, but you're not required to be. Whereas the old rules were you were required to be. Um, I think from a client standpoint, I think they want us to be. So yeah. um, uh, Kim, any final words on just some idea, any any thoughts that you have on cost segregations, R&D, um, these tax benefits that are huge tax benefits that people miss so often? Yeah, they, they are missed. And a lot of it is just because they don't have the resources or the knowledge to be able to do it. So that's what we're here for. That's what Engineer Tax Services is here for. We've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I, I do want to leave, uh, you know, with an R&D comment. Um, if you are going to move forward with filing the uh, return without a research and development tax credit, okay, make sure to list the tax credit as a dollar. Make sure that you're allowing for the 280E elect 280C election, because if you don't do that and you go back to file it and you want to file the amended return, then you're going to be alleviating it and you're going to have to add that credit back to income and pay tax on the credit. If you elect that 280C, then and just file it with a dollar, and then that reserves the right to still take that 280C election. And when you do file the amended return, you do not have to add it. You can only do it in a, in a current tax year. You cannot do it um, on an amended return uh, unless you you file for that election. Okay, so please make sure that if you are going to file, if there's any chance that a client is eligible for research and development tax credits or they're filing 174 expenses. Um, whether you did the credit or not, file it with a dollar and file to elect that uh, 280C election to keep that open. That's probably the most valuable tip I can give you um, for you and your clients. That's awesome. Really appreciate that, Kim. Kim, uh, where would people go to get more information about you and Engineer Tax Services? Yeah, thank you. Um, so our website is engineeredtaxservices.com and that's engineered with the ED on the end and then tax services with the S on the end. Um, my profile is on there under our team. You can certainly email me from there um, or you can shoot me an email directly. Uh, please let them know that you heard from us um, on the Wheelwright Show because that's very important. Um, and we can, uh, you can email me. Uh, my name is Kim Lockridge and it's L O C H. R-I-D-G-E. So it's K Lockridge at engineeredtaxservices.com. And feel free to reach out to me. My phone number is on the site. You can reach me directly and I'd love to work with you. I, I appreciate that, Kim. And and um, just remember that, you know, our clients, uh, they care, what they value most is their bottom line. Um, tax returns, they it's nice. You know, we, they, they know it's important, but that is not their number one concern. Their number one concern is their bottom line and anything we can do that is within the law um, to help them with that. And I would uh, point everybody to uh, my two books, Tax-Free Wealth, Chapter 7 is on the um, magic of depreciation. That's the na name of the chapter. And Chapter 4 of the Win-Win Wealth Strategy is about real estate. So I uh, highly encourage uh, if you have any questions about how it works in this country or any other country, you can go to uh, my two books. 
and uh, very, ex very happy that Kim was able to join us today. Just remember, when we are constantly looking for what's best for our clients, we're going to end up with better clients, a better practice, and a better life. We'll see you all next time. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.